Hey folks, today I'm here with Chris Knight. He is a portrait photographer, he's an educator, and also an author. Today's interview is all about the dramatic portrait. Chris Knight, welcome to the show, man. How's it going? Doing well. How about yourself? Great I'm to doing, be here. I'm doing doing pretty good. Uh, this is going to be an interesting interview because you have a pretty outstanding, impressive body of work going on over there, and it, uh, yeah, and you wrote a book to tell others how you did it. You know, for the most part, I, I, I did. Hence, hence why I'm here. Hence, while you're here, and now you're on the press tour telling people about the book that tells people about how you created the impressive body of work. Look at that. That's awesome. So, 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 something like that, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, tell us about that. Like, like for the people who may not be familiar with Chris Knight, tell us kind of, you know, the, the Reader's Digest version of the Chris Knight origin story. Oh, wow. Um, so I'm a, I'm a portrait photographer uh, based in New York. Um, that's primarily where I work. I'm a teacher here at a couple of schools. I teach at Pratt Institute and New York Film Academy uh, here in New York. I teach uh, everything from photo one all the way through through retouching and basic and advanced Photoshop, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, I've been up here for uh, six, six, seven years, I think, mm -hmm. up, up at this point, maybe, maybe a little bit less, six years, five, six years. Um, originally, I grew up in, in Florida, uh, did a lot of commercial lifestyle work. Uh, I worked in the Miami market for a while, then came up here and threw it all away and uh, started again and that's where I'm at. That's awesome. Yeah, perfect. Perfect synopsis and perfect lineup. Um, a couple of questions that I have, even based on, I have a ton of questions, but even a few popped up just based on you introducing yourself that way. Is uh, One of them is around retouching, and we'll just dive right in. So you're sure. retouching, clearly a retouching expert if you're able to teach others. And, and I, I saw, I was, I was a retoucher first. I was a retoucher. I mean, I won't say first, but, but I started in Photoshop. Jesus, uh, 18, 19 years ago. I think mm -hmm. it was Photoshop 4 was the first thing. I, I was like 12. I was uh, going to say, what were you, like a zygote? Yeah, I was, like, what I, was, I, was in, <laughs> I was in seventh grade. We had it on the school's computers. And uh, I just kind of started started messing around from there. And then I went like to the library because YouTube wasn't a thing yet. And yeah. nothing online. And I got Photoshop for dummies. And I sat down with a book. And I said, okay, let's figure this out. And yeah. kind of kind of a page at a time. Yeah. Um, and I messed around. I just messed around with Photoshop on and off for for several years. Uh, and I got into it quite a bit more seriously once I picked up photography again, which which wasn't until like college, right after college. Yeah, and in all this, all the questions I'm asking are about the dramatic portrait, which, by the way, is the title of the book that we mentioned earlier, which I'll show right now. So, the dramatic portrait. Uh, wh who is this book for? Who is it designed for? Who'd you write it for? Right. Who'd you have in mind when you were sitting down there in late nights pecking away at the keyboard? Right, right. Um, so we actually we we kind of had this discussion early on because it's it's tough to to kind of write a book un unless you know who who it's for. Mm -hmm. So we we targeted it at the mid level photographer looking to to go up a little bit more. Um, the way the way we approach it is, is it's not a textbook on every single ingredient that you need for either portraiture or lighting. It's more about my process. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of a breakdown of, of that process. So it follows my workflow, so to speak, uh, in terms of how I approach uh, photography and image making, creation of an image from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, a big part of of my inspiration is drawn from classic painting and, and, and kind of everything that follows along with classic painting and, and portraiture. Yep. And I always found it to be so incredibly fascinating, uh, all these different ways in which basically the human form has been portrayed over the years. And so it's this, uh, I, I call it like cocktail party version of art history and uh, it's not going to make anyone an expert, but it's kind of enough to to be able to have like a, like an abridged cocktail party version of of a lot of these different movements, um, which are not necessarily all portraiture, but you still kind of have to learn them because they all fit into this this roadmap of yeah, of and, it. And then, 
And Photoshop is just in, in in terms of getting your brain around Photoshop. It's almost like like medicine. You know, you will never un if you're a doctor. Yeah, you could be a specialist in certain areas, but you're never going to know everything there is about every single discipline there is in medicine. Same with Photoshop. It's many Absolutely. things to miss many people. I was looking at your book, which is great, by the way. And I was thinking, yeah, this is like you, like just what you said. This is. Yeah, there's no way you're going to create the Photoshop Bible. Even when they tried to create the Photoshop Bible, it didn't work, right? So now, sure. you know, but you can give one man's perspective into how I use it to get my work done and how I use it to create these fantastic images, right? Right. Well, I mean, it's not meant to be a one-stop shop for any singular part. So with, with lighting, I'm a, I'm a big... I'm a big uh, proponent of lighting and, like, I love, I love lighting and, and all that kind of stuff. So... I dig into that a bit, but at the end of the day, you know, most photographers who are uh, successful, they're all pretty much working with the same set of tools. They have the same toolbox, and they're making their own images with it. And why is it that you can look at an Ellen von Unworth or Richard Avedon or an Irving Penn, and like, what is it about them that allows them to create images that are uniquely their own? And so. The main goal, the main arc of the book is to equip people with the tools and to at least show you what to consider when you are approaching uh, a body of work, mm -hmm. which will hopefully lead to your own stylistic uh, approach to creating that work. So it's, it's really about um, how you can craft your own style um, or what ways you can, uh, what, what tools you can use to craft your own style. It's just a matter of putting it into this mindset of going, okay, well now I, I kind of see what I need to use. How do I channel all of these things, uh, into the greater idea mm -hmm. of what these images are trying to create? Now, now that, that begs the question, so you bring up style, and we talk about style a lot on the show in terms of how do you define your own personal style, how, what's the path to figuring out, you know, what my look is, you know, and, but then the question, and this, this, is, this comes up from a conversation I had with a, a gentleman a couple days ago, um, and I asked him about what his personal style was, this is just an over coffee discussion, it wasn't an interview, and he was saying that he doesn't have a personal style. He's like, I, he's, an, he's not a professional, granted, but he's sure. an advanced amateur who has very high, a high level of skill, right? And I'm, yeah. I said, what's your, what's your style? What's your genre? And he said, I don't have one. I just like to shoot a lot of stuff, you know? There's, so, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. So to people like that, so that, that's the question, because people listening to this, and if they've li been listening to TWIP for any amount of time, they hear that. Like, if I want to go, if I want to get really good and get and be the Chris Nye New York, you know, running around and, and I'll, you know, be that photographer, I need I'm, to develop really a style. Good. I'm a brisk walker. I'm a brisk walker. <laughs> okay, bridge and tremble. Okay, so I, you, they, but we say, we preach that you need, to, you need to figure out what your personal style is and focus on that and not be a jack of all trades. So help me reconcile that. Do you need yeah. a personal style or, or don't you? That's, that's a really good question. So it, it really boils down to what you want out of your photography. Uh, do you just want to go and shoot and dick around and do whatever moves you at that particular point in time? Mm -hmm. No. You know, if, if you and, – and, and I encounter all kinds of people who do photography as a hobby. And so they're not actually out to do anything more than what gives them – joy in their free time. Right. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, I, I think it's probably at the end of the day, maybe even a little bit uh, more more pure happiness because you don't have to deal with a lot of the the day-to-day -day mundane things mm -hmm. that photography can bring. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to be a working photographer, Mm -hmm. I do think that the concept of style is very, very important. Now, it obviously depends on where you want to be that working photographer, sure, sure. right? So, you know, certain places, you know, if, if you're a portrait studio in a small town, you know, you may think that your style 
or this concept of style doesn't necessarily apply to you, but I promise you it does. Wedding photographers, it does. Mm -hmm. Small portrait studios, it does. Um, you know, certain things it, it may lend itself a little bit less to, but when, when people are hiring a professional, they understand that there is a certain amount of competency that's to be expected. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to get to the point where I realized that competency wasn't the goal, like understanding the tools wasn't the goal, or being able to recreate anyone else's work wasn't the goal. It was this idea of, all right, now, now I can just kind of, oops, sorry, now I can just kind of pick and borrow and choose and pull from all these different places, and you can start to create something that uh, that can be inspired by other people, but yeah. but should be uniquely yours. Because at the end of the day, you want someone to go, hey, I need fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Who do I go to for that? And yeah. doesn't matter what your thing is, you just kind of got to figure out what that thing happens to be. Yeah, and part of that is uh, what you said. Part of it is you could photography is easily commoditized, right? So you could be part of you know like like a plumber. Like if you want to, no disrespect to plumb, no disrespect no, I, I, to I plumbers. Use, I, I use this exact same analogy all the time. No, no, go go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no disrespect to plumbers, but you can call a plumber, and if you have a leaky sink, they're gonna fix the leaky sink if they have a level of skill to fix the leaky sink. And the next plumber right. that you call, if they have a similar level of skill, you're gonna come away with the same fixed leaky sink. If you want to be in that group of of commoditized people that you're just gonna click the shutter and walk away, and there's no kind of personal thumbprint on the work then that's one thing and it's totally yeah. valid to be that. But then if you, like you were saying, if you want to move up to a pro and someone who their work is their calling card, then that, then that takes the development of a personal style. And by the way, um, for you chime in, chapter eight in your book is called personal style, page 209. That is some gold right in there. Your subtitle is you do you. Right? So, you do you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, do you agree with that, that it's, it's kind of bifurcated into commoditized and pro? I, I, I do. I, um, you know, and, and to be fair, even a lot of people at the highest end uh, sell their personal thumbprint for very high prices when, uh, when the client is paying enough. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You know, some of the most creatively underwhelming work I've ever done has paid me the most. And I have no problem with that <laughs> yeah. because... You know, at the end of the day, that's that's yeah, that's, yeah. that's the it, give and it take. It funds the other yeah. stuff, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you know, we were talking about this the other day, but but photography is so fundamentally unique to pretty much every other creative art form that came before it, mm -hmm. in that commerce is so uh, inherently injected into its DNA. Uh, you know, like the 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 ad agency or the the artist agency, art and commerce, right? That's the fundamental building block of what photography is. When photography was created, uh, you know, when it when it came about 150-ish years ago, mm -hmm. um, it was created as this almost novelty. No one really had anything. I you know, no one had any idea what to do with it yet. It was like, all right, let's kind of document reality and let's let's make a picture. Right. And they would they would travel around and they would they would, you know, sell this, the early photographers. Yeah. And it was this this way to document reality um, as a way to to make money. And it wasn't for was it 50, 60 years after that, uh, that that uh, that genesis of what photography was, it actually started to develop into its own kind of art medium. They hadn't quite figured out what it was. So the idea of, of photography as, as a true creative medium is still young. Yeah. I mean, it, it didn't really figure it out until around, you know, the, the, the turn of the century uh, with like Stieglitz and stuff. Uh, but then again, it really didn't turn into what photography is currently until like 50 years ago in the 60s with, with Sarkovsky. Yeah. Now, when, when you look at and you're in a unique position to answer this question, being an educator, an author, working photographer. So you you are you're you have a toe in the pro world, so you're up to date on the zeitgeist of what clients want and all that stuff. But then you have a toe in the amateur world because you're 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 molding young photography minds. When you look at the the young photographers coming in, 
what is what is kind of the the biggest hurdle that they have they have to get over? Do you think these days? Um, it it really depends on honestly where they come from, which which I think is interesting. It's it's all over the place, and and you know I'm I'm fortunate to to be able to uh, teach teach kids or students students from uh, from all over the world, and it's really interesting that that people from different parts of the world um, come with their own idea of what they think they need to learn. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is always kind of, kind of interesting. And then on top of that, they come with um, oftentimes different uh, cultural preferences for aesthetics. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I may personally prefer something desaturated. Mm -hmm. And then you try to explain that to someone who loves color being completely vibrant and saturated sure, and just sure. those yeah. small little things um are kind of a kind of an interesting little element i think the the biggest hurdle is almost always that gear doesn't matter as much as people want you to think it does yeah well, you mean uh, as the people that make the gear want you to think it does <laughs> yeah or or you know to, to be fair like a lot of the f photographic community hey let's Let's, uh, you know, you need this light, you need this, this camera. Yeah. See, you I know mean, what, let me, let me pause you right there because that, that is the crux of a lot of hangups that a lot of new photographers get that I see. And it is, yeah, you come into this industry and you, you of course you're going to get, you know, you get excited, you start reading websites and listening to podcasts and blogs and all this stuff and YouTube and tutorials and all this stuff. And you get excited and jazzed about this stuff and you feel like you need the right gear to do it but then you don't know who to listen to in order to tell you what the right gear is you could easily get the wrong gear that's why people ha always have the question that we all don't like which is which camera should i buy right because they don't know which sure. camera because there's so many options out there it's like which phone right. should i buy right who right. knows what phone you should buy right. right so how do you jump through that yeah we can easily say gear doesn't matter but it does in, it does you know, sort of, but it does In sort furtherance of. of your vision, right? Right. And, and, and I, I talked about this. There's, I, I think I added a little section on the book in that. I'm like, cool. it, it doesn't matter, but it does. Um, and, and it's kind of... It, it, most cameras made in the last five years that are, you know, SLRs mm -hmm. are... Or mirrorless. Or mirrorless. Or, or mirrorless. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the ability to to change and shoot manually easily. How about that? Any yeah. camera that gives you the ability to shoot manually easily. There you go. Anything that's been been uh, made in the last five years is gonna probably be good enough for you for now when you're starting. Yeah. Um. You know, at, at the end of the day, it's it's you know it's not going to change your life that much to shoot on a $3,000 camera or a $1,500 camera, you're not going to see that much of a difference. Yeah. And uh, something that can fundamentally operate in a manual way, simply a good pro can operate, operate it well and take yeah. great photos with it. So in that way, it doesn't matter. However, the best tools do improve the lives of the professionals who know how to use them. Right. And there is a point at which the gear matters, but I usually say it takes about six or seven years. Yeah. I mean, and like you said, I mean, it all depends, right? You have to know what it is you're shooting. For example, if you're a, a street photographer and you like going out at 1 a.m. getting shots of the city while it sleeps, you probably right. want something that has, uh, you know, that can shoot low noise, high ISO or low noise, right. you know, and have a, 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 a higher sensitivity to light than something like, you know, a Micro Four Thirds camera, which is OK, but not a Sony A7S. Right. Right. Or or because I always think this is a really interesting experiment because I, I, I really do love street photography. When you're in New York, the size of the camera you have. Uh, actually has an impact on what the photographs look like. If you have something small and, and very innocuous, uh, inconspicuous, uh, you, you, you take it up and you take the picture and no noise and no one notices anything. I've gone out and I've done street photography with uh, my 645Z, which is massive, and you bring it up and people look 
right at you, and it actually oh, changes you, the you dynamic. You must be a real photographer. Well, it's eye contact with the, with the camera as opposed to something that's almost a little bit more stealthy. Yeah. And so it really depends on you know what you're actually trying to get out of out of the experience because because cameras can make a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you want to shoot right. I was going to. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that perception. Per, you know, along with that whole gear question, what camera should I buy? It is perception, you know, negative and positive. For example, sure. on the negative side, you're you're going to some concert or something with your Z, you know, they're not going to let you in, right? <laughs> so, you know, right. but if you show up with your iPhone, everybody has a phone, you could take, right. you could take probably decent shots with it right. there. And if you're a street photographer, the larger the camera, the more self-conscious the subject is, is going to be. And that reminds me of like, um, God, what is it? Uh, quantum physics or what? I you know. There's this theory in quantum physics from Einstein. It's called spooky action at a distance where, okay. yeah, it, it is. Look it up. It's cool. I, I'm going to take your word for it. Yeah, look it up. Google <laughs> spooky action at a distance. And basically it says that things that aren't related to something else can affect it. Right. So okay. you could excite an electron over here and over in uh, Philly at some cheesesteak place, a corresponding electron will will move based on what you did. So, it's, yeah, I think of that when I think of photography, because it's like, yeah, the camera affects the outcome, even though it's not touching it or anything. It's oh, a, it's totally affecting. agree. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. A hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So people shouldn't get yeah, that that what camera should I buy question is is definitely a loaded question because it how much money do you have? What are you shooting? That's, that's usually the, the next question, right? <laughs> how how much do you want to spend? I don't know. Well, you need to figure that out cuz there's a wide range. Yeah. I know. Well, Chris, let's switch gears to your work, man. So looking at some of your portraits and along with that style, people can see as these photos flash by there's a style here, right? You you have a vision. You know what you like. You, there's a palette of of colors that that you like in your images. What led you down the path to get to this particular style? Uh, I mean, well, it's it's something that I'm I'm into, I guess. Now it's styles change and they evolve, and you know what I'm shooting now is different than what I was shooting two, three years ago, and sure. vice versa. Uh, but you know. Style was this thing that it took me a long time to figure out how important it was. Uh, I got I got competent relatively quickly uh, mm -hmm. when I was when I was learning. I'd say within within a couple of years, I, I was I was competent. And then I spent the vast <laughs> I spent much longer being mediocre. Um, <laughs> I'm still I, I'm still in that phase, by the way. <laughs> oh no, listen, listen. <laughs> It was it was one of the most frustrating things for me because I was like I, I would recognize I can do that I can do that I can do that, and it was hard to to reconcile the reason why I wasn't getting the stuff I could do I wasn't getting the jobs like well I can do it like why why is this an issue right um, I ultimately figured out once I started developing something that was cohesive and uh, a pointed, I was pointed series of words that was that could define my work. Mm -hmm. uh, people started coming to me more for that, and people, you know, clients want to come to you for your thing, yeah. whatever your thing happens to be. So it just really depends on 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 you know how quick you can get to that point. And it it what, it are, took what are your words? What are your words? So this is actually uh, this is a Lindsay Adler exercise that that I got from her and and I love to uh, I love to, to 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 use it as a way to describe to break down style and everything. Mm -hmm. And she goes basically think of three to five words that define your work. Uh, basically, it it should be it should almost hit the the person who's looking at your portfolio over the head when they look at your website, right? Mm -hmm. And then think about what you want those words to be if they are not the same thing. And so going forward, as you develop your book or your portfolio, you always want to keep these words in mind as a way to uh, to kind of guide your work uh, to get to that point. So, so mine is uh, dramatic, uh, either theatrical or cinematic, nice. uh, painterly. 
um, and then I, I like a like a timelessness or a, a, a an idea where you don't quite know the time. Doesn't feel super super modern or old. It kind of fits in this weird. So that's 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 mine. It's so it's, timeless, it's, uh, timeless, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I'm looking so at some of these shots here, and they, they definitely have that. The other aspect that these that the shots I'm looking at, and I'm on chrisnightphoto.com right now. Um, the other aspect that these photos that I'm looking at have is they all have a story. They all have an underlying story. Either one, you know, for the most part, there's some that are you know model shots or or straight up portrait shots. But even those, there's an element of of drama to the shots. And one of the things that I complain about a lot to the chagrin of all the people around me is that I love great, I, I mean, I'm in this field, I love to look at great images, however they come, but as I get older, the thing that, that my brain instantly goes to, and I think it's just because I'm a human, is, is what's the story behind this? And if there's no story, or if I have to reach too far to figure out what the story might be, I feel like it lost something that that could have easily been won like looking at your photos i can look at 90 percent of and and without even reading any words weave a story around what was going on there even like in the top left there's a, a guy a red-haired guy with a scarf around his neck right i can kind of weave in my head who's this guy is he an immigrant is he this you know like is he an immigrant in the in the third you know what's going on you know it kind of feels like that and some of the more obvious ones are you can definitely weave a story around what's going on is that the how do you start these shots as chris knight do you do you sit down and you're hanging out having dinner with someone and you you know you have an epiphany because you see someone with a funky hairstyle you're like you know what that could make a shot or do you you have a sketchbook like what's what's your process for starting yeah, I mean, it, re it really depends. Uh, it comes from a lot of different places, and it depends on how much uh, I'm thinking through something. Sometimes it's not very thought out at all. It's just, here's a person, let's get a portrait of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's usually no more than... Sometimes it's, it's very instantaneous, especially like a model shot. I, I kind of maybe look through their book, um, and it's not really rooted in anything more than... Uh, what they look like. Other times, uh, I'm able to do research uh, if, if that particular subject has information available on them, mm -hmm. and I try to spend an hour or two learning about them um, and, and kind of getting into that headspace so that I can at least come to the table with some knowledge uh, about them. Whether it's a way to relax them or, or bring that into the to the images, yeah. uh, sometimes it's a very loose idea. Uh, so with the redheaded guy, I wanted to do something that was themed around uh, Les Misérables. Mm. Uh, so so that was what that was. I saw the guy and I'm like, oh, you know, he just he really had a great look. Yeah. Uh, and, and so so I, I wanted to do a Les Misérables thing with him. Uh, and then sometimes, so like I've got the Saint Sebastian images, and then I've got. The uh, the nativity with Kim and Kanye, uh, which are in my my special special projects. You know, I was going to uh, ask you about that. I was like, is that really them? And it is. <laughs> it, it's not. It's not really them. Wait, it's no. not really them. <laughs> no. But but those those I had had for a long time. The Kim and Kanye thing uh, that was almost two years from start to finish. Uh, I, I kind of sketched it out and, and drew it out and, wow. and planned what each of those people would be and what it would mean and all these things. Uh, the St. Sebastian was another one I probably spent eight months to a year on it before I actually shot it and, and working out the logistics of it. Um, that's actually, uh, I, I love that series. Um, it was something that I spent a long time developing um, and like all the arrows and the wounds, I had a special effect artist, like I ordered the arrows from China and then I sawed them down and I brought them to a special effect artist and she made the wounds. It's like all the wounds and the arrows are practical. Um, wow. and then the rock and then I got, I got the whole thing in the set and basically what's photoshopped out are the strings holding up the arrows cause they couldn't self support. So I had yeah. assistance on both sides holding them up. Um, and I got, I took this, I took the stuff off the sides. But uh, but other than that, I mean, it's it's pretty much exactly what you see. Like I had the loincloth made. Wow. Um, 
See, that's and some so, thought. So you built this image. And, you know, a lot of people think, you know, it's serendipity or, or if it's it's filled of dreams. You know, if you if you think it, you can dream it, it will come. Just assemble, assemble a, a good looking model, a good photographer, a stylist and a makeup artist. And this kind of image will just magically pop out. Right. Probably yeah, I mean, that, not that, so. Uh, that, that kind of stuff requires a little bit more planning. I mean, some, sometimes, <laughs> like with the with the fashion stuff, you can say, okay, here's the mood images we go for. You send it to the stylist, they pull the clothes, send it to the makeup artist, they're they're on it. You pick your models, you bring them in. And there's quite a bit less planning that's involved. Yeah. Uh, but those in particular, like the, the the Kim and Kanye, we had to we flew in a, a a Kim impersonator from like Detroit or something. And then I I still please tell me you guys went out and partied after that and hung out and uh, impressed people. I I did, but the Kim and Kanye they they did. They were out in in St. Louis. Like the the set was built. Um, you know, we we craned in like that that chandelier is is actually hung from a from a like a like a big boom arm. Mm -hmm. Um, but but I did that with with RGGEDU as like a long form tutorial, and that was kind of like the flagship. Uh, that was like the third the third day, the most complicated setup. And we spent like a day basically getting this one shot. And it was building the people in and getting them in and composition right. There's actually the um, – like the, the – I wanted, I wanted uh, like narrative to the lighting. So yeah. the, the, the tension on the Kim's face is actually the speed light like in the shot. And uh, that speed light is actually slaved – to the, the strobes in the scene. So it was actually firing when, when the strobes were going off. Wow. And so, and so, yeah, so I wanted this idea of creating something that felt like a classic painting, but even that narrative of where the light comes from actually has this more practical, uh, application. Yeah. And then we got them as close as we could. We styled them, I think, I think pretty well. And then uh, I still had to go through and Photoshop and really liquefy the face to to get it even better. But but so, I, so the I shot, the the light coming from the the photographer on the left of Kim, uh, and we'll throw this image up. Is uh, is that light? That's that's is that done in post or was that actually there when you shot it? The speed light. The speed light. Yeah. 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 No. It, so that's it was, the light you're talking about. Lost. So that speed light was yeah. that you captured that at the time it was shot. That's correct. That's I gelled crazy. it blue, so it's a little bit slightly of a different temperature. Yeah, but yeah, it that's was, that was there. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it was because because okay, here's the thing, right? So it's always like I, I love one of the things I love about photography is the constant problem solving. Like it's 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 problem solving across the board. It's like puzzles. And I was like, okay, I want to put this light in. All right, well, how do I make it work? Well, I can't use Canon because. Canon doesn't have a slave feature on their on their flash, so we ended up like going and finding like some some cheap young Guno uh, flash, young Nuo. We because, all know about because, those <laughs> because they have it. They have it, and so we, we threw it on, and it's just it's firing off, and it, it worked. Wow, yeah, that's that's crazy. So that's a good segue of this conversation into post production. So and your your process for post production, and I think you go into some of this in the in the book, but but. Post production, your philosophy on it are when, like some of the photographers that I that I interview, widely different ideas about what post production is. For example, several sure. years ago, I interviewed uh, Sue Bryce, and yep. and Sue Bryce, I asked her about her post production and how what her workflow was because she's a master retoucher, and she was basically telling me that she spends minutes per image, and they mm -hmm. come out looking. You know, I mean, if you've seen right. Sue Bryce's work, you know what they come out. Yeah, of course. Uh, and then other people say, yeah, I'll spend hours on one image. And other people, like just last week, I interviewed a gentleman who said he doesn't look at photography as the decisive moment or capturing everything in one shot. He looks at it more linearly where he's capturing pieces that he will then later composite together to create the vision in his mind's eye. Where do, where do you fall on that? Um, well, there is... It, I, I I get you know people the, there's I get I get all sides you know mm -hmm. but but the thing that I think frustrates me the most is when people go oh well you know those images are it's too much post it's mm -hmm. a lot of Photoshop in these images mm -hmm. and I just want to go well, are are we still having this argument in 2017 thank you like is this <laughs> is this really what people still want to fight about like uh, Photoshop's here yeah it's not going anywhere. Right. So cool it. Yeah. Uh, but 
I I definitely have no problem with uh, with manipulation. Um, it really depends on the amount. So sometimes I will spend 30, 30 minutes on an image, 30, mm -hmm. 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I will spend hours. Yeah. It really, really depends. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with that, yeah. It just, it's... I, I think it was Eric Almas had said some while ago, he's like, I'm not a photographer, I'm an image maker. Mm -hmm. And I use photography as part of that, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm still out there to create images. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I think whatever it is you want to do, like, is fine. If you, if you want to not do anything, if you want to do a million things, mm -hmm. whatever floats your boat, just don't be a dick about it. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, but even then, I, so I'm looking at your work and I, I instantly feel I feel uh, I feel like you're expensive. I feel like there's a high level of professionalism in your shots. I feel like if I hire you, I kind of know what I'm going to get, you know, which is which is professional. If you flip that to to amateurs and advanced amateurs in, in, in or just to rewind, I know that you're you know, you're going to clean up these images. You're going to do what it takes to make sure this image is a saleable image and it and it's perfect before any other human see it besides you. I get that feeling from these images. Yeah, so I'm definitely the, the amateur anal. or the advanced amateur. Where is the line between passing your work off as I shot that like that because I'm a great photographer and I can do no wrong versus yeah, I spent three days in Photoshop to make sure that this looked like I was great. And then you pass it off as it all happened in a 60th of a second. Like, how do you, how, where, where do you draw that line? Um, uh, for me personally, uh, I, I, will, just them. I will. I mean, not you, because you're yeah. an artist and you, you know, you're an sure. educator. So it's all bets are off. But you I, know. I, I will say that, uh. I usually people people assume my work has a lot of post production on it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot less than people think. Uh, it's it's largely done in the develop process, which I think people don't utilize enough. Mm -hmm. Like how how much you can actually make the image look a certain way uh, in Lightroom or in, in ACR. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, it's it's whatever works best for you. I mean, if you want to be the photographer that spends all the time shooting and spends no money or spends no time on on the post production fine if you uh want to spend a little bit and then spend a million hours in photoshop because that's where you you want to spend your time that's yeah. fine right. it, it's about you know what what your time is worth and where yeah. i you know i started taking photography more seriously because i i wanted to have better images to work on yeah and yeah. And so, you know, I, I say that I, I learned a lot about Photoshop to spend less time doing it yeah. uh, for, for speed sake. So it's really where you want to place your time. There's no right or wrong. As long as the people who are looking at your pictures are happy, um, as long as your clients are happy, uh, as long as you're happy, that's that's really what matters at the end of the day. I don't I don't think there's this this uh, definite right or wrong. Yeah. It you know it's 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 and it's going to be a moving slider uh, yeah. down the road as well. So it it depends on where you can leach your catharsis catharsis from, right? You know exactly. Do, do you get exactly. it from the process? Do you do you find solace in the process of taking the photos and all that? It just makes you go ah. Oh. Or do you when you're in the computer and you got all your images all set in a folder and it's time to get down to build that ship in a bottle? Do you go ah? Yeah. Oh. You know, okay, now I can have some fun and have my glass of and wine. Some people love yeah. Each side. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, it's a slider, right? So, I, I, I do think though that most, I'm gonna say most, a large number of people who openly, uh, you know, yell against how bad Photoshop sucks. Yeah. And how much it's ruining photography. I would say most of those people aren't good at photoshop yeah, and that's, that's one of the reasons they don't like it that's the fear um and they, they don't want to learn something new yeah. uh because of the way things have, have been done in their eyes for 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 a while yeah. but at the end of the day photoshop and post-production in general it's 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 a tool in the toolbox like anything else yeah. it's a tool like lighting uh, it's a tool like knowing your camera and styling it just it's it's something that helps you 
articulate your final vision, whatever that happens to be, um, and you can use it a little bit or a lot, whatever whatever is most effective uh, for the image. Yeah, yeah. There are all these tools, the camera, you know, if you're shooting video, the audio gear, the software, Lightroom, Photoshop, you know, whatever you're using, these are all tools that are in service to you as the image maker to tell the story. Right? In service the story, exactly. Yeah, in exactly. service of the story, yeah. So then my, my last question for you, Chris, is um, you mentioned earlier the book, right? So the the idea used to be back in the day that you know every you, you weren't anything unless you had a really strong quote book and that was literally a physical book right it was your right. portfolio that you would shop around take out you know had a, a a dust cover on it you know and you you present it to people and the better the photographer you were the bigger the images and you turn the pages and explain each image to the person that was looking and then hopefully you walk right. away with the job that's changed, right? That whole dynamic has changed and been democratized in a lot of ways. For example, I'm looking at your website here, which is beautiful, straight to Thank the point. You. I know how to contact you. I can do a number of things and follow you on social media, etc. But a lot of people that I talk to these days have even foregone this. Like they're they're they've no leapfrogged the book, the physical book, the oh. website, and have gone straight to Instagram as. Sure. As this is my book, you want to see what I do? I'm IG, you know, Frederick Van Johnson, whatever, right? So how do you, sure. how do you like? Where do you fall on that? You know, as an educator, as you instruct your your students, do you tell them, hey, you need to go set up your Instagram, or do you need to build a website or a physical? Book? I mean, I, 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 I make them, I make them set up a website because, uh, because I mean, honestly, what it, it costs eighteen dollars a year mm -hmm. to host a website. Uh, get get a website. Yeah. Um, the the more the, the greater the imprint that you can make uh, online, the the better you will uh, be. Listen, obviously, social media is is an important part of yeah. of promotion and and business. Um, but if you are only on social media, I I I, I this is purely personal opinion, but I think that. People don't necessarily uh, give would give you as much value as if you had a website. Yeah, take you seriously. Right? Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't take you as seriously. Yeah. Um, so, so get a website. Um, get on social media. Basically, you should buy up all of the social media real estate, whether or not you use it or not. Yeah. So, if a new platform comes out. That's popular. You should get it just to, to own your name. Squat. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was I was uh, a little bit foolish when I when I started out because uh, I was like, I'm going to buy Chris Knight photo uh, because there was another photographer in Chicago who who owned Chris Knight photography and he photographed uh, nude male erotica, which is fine. Uh, it's fine. No, no, it's fine. I love it's how like, you say that. Do. Which is fine. <laughs> it's fine. No, the, the the best thing was I have I have some very 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 conservative relatives who would Google me oh. and they'd pull up Chris Knight photography just dicks 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 everywhere. <laughs> I thought it was the funniest thing. Um, but 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 um. He he eventually uh, he closed the photography business probably eight or nine years later, and I finally was able to to buy the domain. But in the meantime, I lost jobs to people who thought he was me, uh, at least like one or two that I know about, um, because because he had a domain that was similar. So you know you don't want to generate all that you know as much, any confusion. Yeah, uh, well, it's you your can. brand. It's your exactly. It's your well, I mean, exactly. they, they, and I, I hate to drag this out. This is a fascinating conversation. But like on that, so the domain selection, which back in the day, you know, was easy. And had I known, I would have registered everything under the sun. <laughs> but it's harder these days, especially mm -hmm. if you have a name like Fred Johnson. Right. I mean, it's sure. You know, sure. It's, it's nearly impossible, which is why I started using my full name, Frederick Van Johnson for. Right. You yeah. know, online and then Frederick Van as a brand. Because I was, frankly, the main reason was I was able to get all the social media profiles for that name. Um, right, right. So, what, so what, 
what do you suggest? I mean, like for for your students, if you have a student named, hey, <laughs> hey, Mr. Knight, my name is James Smith. Should I go get jamesmith.com? You're not going to get jamesmith.com. <laughs> you should go by a different name. <laughs> you know, go to the Hall of Records first. <laughs> yeah, so what, what should they do? Like, is it... Is it better to still keep your name and add some sort of, uh, you know, modifier on it, like photo? Or yeah, I mean, do you that, pick a different a name? Idea. Like, do you go with, like, James Smith, do you go with, you know, smithcrazyphotography.com or something? I think, I think it depends on the person. Um, I've, I've had people uh, come to me with very, names that were very difficult to spell. Yeah. And I think that's a tough thing. To, to get people to, to, to draw people to. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I will say shorten it up or use a different name, but then at the same time, you don't want to necessarily, I think, use something that's very generic. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be, and I, I have no idea who this person is, but Shutterbug Studio or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm sure that's a thing. I, I, I'm but, sure it is. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't know how I would find, you know what I mean? It's, it's a little bit, a little bit too generic. Yeah. So I, I, I do think that, that you want to find some way to brand yourself. I, I had a kid, a uh, really talented, uh, photographer did some, some fashion, some kind of cool, funky fashion stuff. And his name was Daniel something. He had a strange last name. And he, he ended up going by like Bambi photo. And, uh, he 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 kind of embraced that that name and like went with like a pink website and it 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 works great. Wow. And so it really just becomes you know what what you want to do with it and you have to figure that out for yourself just yeah. like any small business that you know has to put a sign outside um you got to figure out what you want you know your business to be. It's yeah. it's part of it. You know? and, and then I, I, I tell people, yeah, that's great. You could do Shutterbug Studio, Bambi, whatever, you know, but down the, you have to think the long game and down the line, 10 or 15 years from now, you're going to be stuck with that. Do you want to keep that? Uh, chances are your name, you're probably still going to have it. It's still going to be relevant to you. So right. <laughs> I'm going to pick that. By the way, I went on Hover.com and I looked up ShutterbugStudio.com. It yeah. is available. Oh, wow, how about for that? For $5,635. Holy shit. <laughs> Maybe that's why nobody has it yet. <laughs> Maybe. Somebody's, somebody's camping on it. Exactly. They're just squatting. Well, let's end this. So you mentioned RGG. You've got a tutorial up on RGG right now. Uh, where where should people go to check that out and to go grab your the dramatic portrait book, etc.? cetera? Sure. Um, uh, RGGEDU.com. Uh, right now they've got, uh, they're running two, two of my, my tutorials together. Uh, one of them is, uh, a shooting process retouching tutorial, um, where we do start to finish on three different shoots. Uh, it's basically the video version. Uh, sorry, it's, it's a video companion to the book. It expands on a lot of what's in the book and kind of ratchets it up, okay. uh, to, to, to 11, so to speak, in terms of production and, so they could, they could get the book and then they like, you know, I dig this. I want to go deeper and actually see stuff. They could go get the course and then exactly. continue and that's, the journey. That's, it's, it's meant to, to go together. Okay. Uh, and then also there is a, a Lightroom tutorial that they offer. I think it's for free uh, for now that goes in with it. Um, and that's just that's a beginner's Lightroom tutorial uh, class. So I'm very proud of that. Um, we spent a lot of time working on it and they really did a tremendous job putting it together and filming it. It looks beautiful, uh, in, independent of, of, of my face. Uh, but, but, uh, but they, they really did a nice job filming it. It looks, looks and sounds and fantastic. Awesome. Um, and then the book, which is on Amazon, Dramatic Portrait. Uh, it's also available at rockynook.com, which is the publisher. You can get it from them as well. Uh, it's available as an ebook and in print. And uh, I don't know what else. And I have the ebook version right here on my uh, my trusty iPad. So yeah, thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, okay, I think that's it. Well, Chris, and then of course your your website, as we've mentioned, is chrisnightphoto.com, right? Chrisnightphoto.com. Also, Chris Knight Photography, but that's just going to redirect you. <laughs> yeah, same with uh, that's the same thing we did. So thisweekinphoto.com and thisweekinphotography will redirect you. So very good. 
Perfect. Very good. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it, man. It's, uh, it's Thanks, been a pleasure. Fred. Hey there, I'm Steve Brazel, and thanks for checking out the TWIP Network on YouTube. If you'd like to keep up to date with all the great shows that we're putting out, be sure to click subscribe, and while you're at it, give us a thumbs up. You can also subscribe on thisweekinphoto.com, where you'll find lots of other great photography shows. Thanks again for checking out the TWIP Network on YouTube.